Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. Join us on our journey into the past, the present, and the future as we explore the relationship between technology and humanity. Together, we are going to find out what it means to live in a society where everything is connected and the only constant is change. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Nintex is the global standard for business process management and automation. The Nintex platform helps their clients accelerate progress on their digital transformation journeys by quickly and easily managing, automating, and optimizing business processes. Learn more at nintex.com. All right, Marco. Sean. We're, we're with our friends again today. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, we have many. We have many friends, thankfully. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful for that. Hopefully not many <laughs> enemies. That, 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 that's yeah. my hope. Okay. That's, that's, that would be a good thing, too. But, it comes, uh, it comes we'll, with the territory. We'll stick you with the friends please. today. <laughs> and our, our friends that we're connecting with are uh, ISSA friends. And uh, our guest today is Marcus Raynham, who we met at ISSA Los Angeles Summit. Uh, yeah. New- Think about that, really. I know. When we had a chance to meet in person, so Marcus, it's uh, it's great to have you on the show again. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna spend some time redefining security, looking looking back to where you started, and uh, get a view into what you see happening, uh, the leapfrog effect on uh, on infosec. So, thanks for uh, thanks for being part of this. Oh sure. Um, my my views have gotten quite a bit darker than they used to be, and if you were at the, the ISSA conference for the talk that I gave, that was pretty dark. So I just feel like I should warn you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're open to, to dystopia, utopia, and, and everything in between. And hopefully what is in between is reality. So we, <laughs> we want to do a reality check here, maybe starting from what was the vision back in the days when you know we were counting on a firewall maybe and uh, where are we now? Do we even have a perimeter now? I'm thinking, Sean, we, we just sure. dig a little bit back in the past. Yeah, let's dig back in the past, and hopefully we'll find... Uh, I'm, I'm picturing if it's completely black, then the light will really shine through well for us. So that, that's my positive view on this. So, so Mark, let's, let's go back to some of your early days and, and some of the work that you started with. Talk to us about what that looked like. So one of the things, if you look at the stuff that I've done, is it's, it's, I think it's very clearly a result of solutions evolving to solve specific problems. So people, people have sometimes tried to you know, dismiss firewalls and technology like that as you know, point solutions where we need a, a, big, you know, a bigger solution to this problem than just something that we can put between two networks. But you know, my, my view has always been that we need these kinds of tactical tools because we don't really fully understand what we're doing in, in the big picture. So, you know, I mean, I got into computing in 1976 when the, the security paradigm for a computer was you ran a wire to a terminal and you plugged it in and then you had to enable it in the operating system for the operating system to, to pull that terminal. So security was pretty good. You didn't have to worry about people, you know, basically buying their own terminal and hooking it into your computer. Yeah, when, you, when, when you say enable it, it wasn't just an on and off toggle. <laughs> it was a whole configuration, right? It wasn't. You know, I mean, it, you know, one of the, the interesting things, you know, I come back from a time when you, you actually built a kernel for your system that you were going to run it on. So you would configure the hardware device drivers that you needed in the operating system for the hardware that you were going to run the stuff on. So we didn't have all these gigantic um, driver frameworks that nothing ever used like we do nowadays. Everything was kind of low and low and lean and mean because it had to be because there wasn't essentially infinite amounts of memory and infinite amounts of processing power to waste. And that had a direct effect on the way that security evolved because you know we we had minimum 
minimal systems. And so we also realized that you don't, you don't want to waste hard drive space by just doing full operating system releases on everything. Um, of course, now that's, that's not really the point, but um, things were small because there was a time when you could actually look at your computing environment and understand it. And I think we've moved away from that to now that the computer environment, computing environment is kind of this meta thing that you use. You use tools to define what you think is in the environment. And if those tools work the way that you think that they work, then your environment is what you think it is. And that, that sounds really squishy, but that's, that's how I see things. You know, I don't, I don't know why I necessarily am going to believe that this thing, this virtual terminal that claims to be coming from here is actually there. And I come from a, I come from a time where you could grab the copper wire and trace the copper wire out to the terminal and go, yes, that is that terminal. So there, there's been a lot of changes and it's all, it's all virtualization. And, um, and, you know, we can, we can talk about that, but, but I see a lot of this is, is, the, the, the whole security dialogue is about controlling complexity. And um, some of the new technologies that are coming around, like software-defined networking and, and software-defined containers for operating systems and stuff like that, those are tools for managing complexity because I think that the software engineers and network engineers who are building networks and software can no longer manage that complexity effectively themselves. So they're using tools to manage that complexity which I think is just going to be a disaster because it means we're moving into an environment where everything that we're working with is no longer comprehended. Well, I like what you said, and it made me think uh, visually in this infinite universe that is expanding when you said that the network is it's what you think it is. Because it made me think like, so you, you define it in your head, but is, is it really stopping there? It's so interconnected and intertwined the complexity that... You can say it is, but is it really? It's almost right. the difference between back in the day, you'd, you'd spin up a Visio and document your network, where now you can <laughs> use a Visio to define your network, right? Well, you're getting connection from everywhere. So yeah. it's. And, and, and part of it was also constrained by cost. I mean, it, it cost a lot to put in a T1 line, and you had to have someone who knew how to do that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, part, part of where I did a lot of my early work in, in firewalls was helping companies connect to the internet because they really didn't understand how to do that. Um, so they would go and they'd buy a firewall and then the, the company that was delivering the firewall was also kind of responsible for helping them. Okay, here's how you here's how you call an ISP and you get these addresses and then oh, and you have to readdress all of your corporate network. What? You know, there was there were these interesting conversations that happened back in those days. And now... And now that's understood to be something that a, a networking and uh, a networking and software team should be able to take care of. But um, you know, you know, the, the consistent thing that I see in all of this is complexity management. And what are the best tools that you have for managing complexity in your systems and networks? Well, that that's a systems administrator is, you know, that's what a systems administrator's job is is to decomplexify de your systems by understanding what their purpose is and what their mission is and making sure that they're designed to do the correct things that they're supposed to do. And one of the other trends that I find is very interesting is a lot of organizations have simply thrown their hands up as far as handling the complexity of operating systems. And now they're, they're just going to run some cloud instance and they're going to convince themselves that it, it doesn't matter because it's disposable. Yeah, and, Mar and Marcus, I want to kind of looking at the current state of things um, leading up to today, if you will. So I'm, I'm, I'm picturing an abstraction layer, and you, you said early days you had to turn things, we're only enable the things that we needed. And, and basically now you, you just throw everything in the mix, right? I might need this, I might need that. It comes with it by default, it's on by default, it's configured to open, open, uh, open, fail safe, fail, fail open, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. But I guess the point is we have so many tools and the tools are bundled in and the capabilities are there and we just use it all, or at least it's enabled all by default, whether or not we use it. So does that re reduce complexity in terms of we don't have to worry about what's no. there, but then also um, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but this also increases the exposure, of course, 
and then the management of it all. It doesn't. I mean, the, the problem is that people perceive complexity to be reduced when they're able to deal with things as a unit. But what they're actually doing is they're not looking at the details anymore for that unit. So if you're running, if you're running some kind of virtual machine environment or something like that, you can spin up a machine and go, look, it's a machine, it's disposable. My unit of computing is one unit of computing. But if you're really running that in an environment where security is critical, you have to ask yourself, does that unit of computing that you've just spun up, does it have a version of internet facing version of SSHD that has a known vulnerability in it? And hint, they all have a known vulnerability in them. So, so you have to understand that. And I think that's part of the problem with these complexity managing tools that people are using all over the place is they just don't understand that the, the, there's still a governance cost to understanding, you know, what's going on. I mean, there was this huge rash where people discovered, oh, wow, cloud storage is fantastic. We can have all the cloud storage that we want. And then nobody bothered to ask what are the correct defaults that we should set our data buckets up in so that just any average person who wants to go around probing for data buckets can't read it, right? You still need to do the, the detailed work of understanding the complex, the complex parts of the system. And that's something that a systems administrator would be the person who would be responsible for doing that. But the big push with cloud computing and some of the, the, the next gen stuff that's going on, the big push is, oh, you don't need a systems administrator anymore. And my answer to that is really, well, someone's gonna have to, someone's gonna have to understand things and manage complexity, or you're gonna have systems that are garbage. There you go. That's so, the review. <laughs> so in terms of complexity, I, I just want to do a very, very big leap in from the past to the present to the future. And I want to start with, you said when you were working on the computer in 1976, you, you had cables, you have actually, you had walls, <laughs> literally office walls, <laughs> close the door and so forth. And then you worked a lot on, on, on bringing innovation on, on the firewalls. And now we're in a position where apparently there are no walls at all. So my question is, is there going to be a new wall that is completely reshaped or, or we just have to get used to living in this infinite well, environment? There, there's going to still be a boundary, whether it's, whether it's a boundary that's in, enforced by something or whether it's just in people's imagination. I think a lot of it now has reduced to being an imaginary boundary. People still say, this is our data and that's their data. Oh, well, if it's your data, you should have these kinds of controls on it. Oh, well, we don't. Well, then it's not your data. <laughs> it's <laughs> public. Um, you know, it, it, and that, uh, that view, when I express it, sometimes shocks people. But for example, Maybe I'm a little bit old school, but I don't believe that you actually have data until you have three copies of it. You need a copy of the data itself. You need a backup copy of it that is in a near online version. And then you need an archival backup of it, which is in a different location from your near online version. You need all three of those or you don't really have the data. You just think you have the data. You know, and that's, that's really odd because nowadays I talk to people who feel that they have data and it's actually that the data is at one cloud service provider. And they know that the cloud service provider has multiple instances of the data at that cloud service provider. But I still feel obligated to ask them, you know, well, what happens if that cloud service provider goes out of business and then they go, well, that would never happen. Oh, oh, really? I mean, I think that's another important part of perspective that those of us who've been with the industry for a long time, we've got that, you know? I mean, I, I remember a period of time where people would have sworn up and down that Digital Equipment Corporation was never gonna go out of business and that Sun Microsystems was gonna be a dominant Unix microcomputer player for forever you know, or that, that Cisco was going to actually develop products other than the iOS router. Um, you know, there, 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 there are these assumptions that I don't think are necessarily valid assumptions all the time. Yeah, we actually had a conversation uh, about being too interconnected to fail and, and this misconception that stuff will be there forever. 
and, until it's not. <laughs> and uh, I know uh, the, the, the guys uh, indistinguishable from Magic Podcast. They uh, here on on the show. They they're doing an episode talking about open source and will the open source stuff survive and and how can companies rely on that? So that's a whole different topic, but. So I know you, you mentioned going really dark into the future and, and I don't know if everything dying off <laughs> is that view that you have. So let's leapfrog into, into the future and let's look at, look at this from both the technical perspective and I don't, I don't think we can ignore the, the human element here either in terms of an understanding because we, we continue to get further and further away from the bits and the bytes and, and further abstracted from how this stuff really works. So what does the future hold for protecting data, protecting systems and the professional practitioner's understanding of how all this stuff works? Sure. Well, one of the, one of the key points that I like to try to get across to everybody that I talk to is Think of, think of all the software that you know and love, all the systems that you think are fantastic, that you really like, that you depend upon. Um, and then imagine that four-fifths of them will be gone in 10 years, because that's about the rate at which things that you love die. I mean, I know, I know people who, who loved Flash Player. I know people who loved you know, Lotus 1-2-3. I know people who used first-generation firewalls and thought that they were the be-all, end-all. Um, but the, the reality is that stuff is being forced into obsolescence increasingly quickly. Um, and that has, that has serious implications. So when I'm oh, let me, let me, let me pause you here, Marcus, quickly before you go even further, because in those cases that you, that you mentioned, there was a replacement perhaps right now. I remember uh, early days, semantic, yeah. buying up technologies and some of those would get sunset and sunsetted and new technologies would come to replace them, which of course put burden on administrators to rip and replace and upgrade and all this thing. But at least there was a path. Are you perhaps suggesting that there may not even be a path for some of these? Well, in some of those cases, I would say that there isn't a path. I mean, what if the thing that replaces it sucks? Um, and that happens, all, that happens all the time. Um, you know, you're forced to use you're forced to use whatever Microsoft wants you to use because they bought up the competitive products, which were perfectly reasonable single point products that did one thing well, and they thought that it would be better to have that built into their great big, big suite that they want to cram down your throat. Um, so they buy the small piece of technology and knock it over, and off you go. I mean, that's that should worry anybody. <laughs> um, I guess a lot of folks had that view with the. Cisco CSA when it went away, right? Yeah. Well, there's the, you know, there's, there's that, there's, there's system logging technologies. There's, you know, there's, there's stuff that implements old standards that are going to go away. And, you know, and this is, this is part of a, a process that causes our software environment to be in a state of constant churn. And I don't think that that's a good thing constantly having to patch bad buggy software also forces our software to be in a constant state of churn. The whole notion that there's a software release where people try to achieve a specific level of consistent quality across an entire software environment um, and then call that a release and then kind of keep, you know, defend that, hold that line that's gone away and we're now on a constant release cycle where people burp out software like it's nothing and there's no consequence to it. Well, I'm sorry, there is consequence to it. So we have this weird situation where you've got, I'm just going to pick somebody off the top of my head, but you've got, for example, Yelp, which is a restaurant review application that doesn't have a whole lot of security implications that I particularly care about. And they release new versions. So they push new versions of that constantly. I finally deleted it because I was sick of it eating up all my bandwidth updating that piece of software. Um, but if that was a piece of software you depended on and it was updating itself every week, how can you trust that piece of software? You know, and I, I'm now I'm using Windows 10 on some of my systems at home. And, you know, I'll leave my system up because I'm, I'm, ripping some movie or something like that. And I come back and my system has just rebooted itself. Oh, sure. It was some piece of software decided to 
schedule that reboot because it thought that that was completely okay. But it's a good thing I'm not using this computer to run a nuclear reactor or something like that. And, and that's, that, that's a different one you're using for that? No, yeah, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the problem. Well, I don't use, you know, I don't use computers anymore for anything that my life really depends on. Mm, that's interesting. That's getting dark. I like it. <laughs> well, you know, so does that mean notebook or what, what, what does that mean? Um, I, I have a, I used to do a lot of my uh, consulting notes in a, in, a, in a notebook. I'd go to a client, especially if it was international. I'd leave everything that could carry electrons at home. And when I got there, I would just buy a, I would buy a burner phone and carry one of those old children's composition notebooks. And I just kept all my notes in that. When I got home, I'd write my report on my computer, which is not connected to any networks, or at least I believe it's not connected to any networks. Um, and then when I was done with transcribing the notes that I thought were interesting and summarizing them and developing my report, I would, I would burn the old copy book. You know, and then I never had any problems with client data leaking out that way. It's just a little bit, a little bit of extra work. And that's really the issue here is there's a lot of places where there's just a little bit extra work and organizations aren't willing to pay that price. If I look at the big picture, do Dolly way back, I see most of what's going on in computer security as part of an, a long going war between IT management and systems administrators. Because the thing they really want to do more than anything is to get rid of the systems administrators. They don't want to have to pay for these people who do nothing except you know, sit around and understand how things work. They'd rather have 10,000 things that they don't understand how they work. Um, and, you know, again, cloud, I see cloud as a terrific repudiation of professional systems administration, rather than having our own system administrators who know how to build storage grids, stuff like that. Let's just, let's just take advantage of Amazon's or Microsoft's and then we don't need to have any of those people. And, you know, <laughs> I'm endlessly fascinated by that because at a certain point, if your organization doesn't have anybody who knows where the bits are, who doesn't know how to back up and restore data, who doesn't know to get their hands on a copy of the bits and configure and protect the bits, do you really have those bits anymore? So, Marcus, I, you know, I'm picturing how an individual could make that decision, maybe even a family, to lock yourself outside of the, the IoT world, the connected world, the clouds, sure. but the business and society in general, when I think about what you said, I really picture a, a dark future because I feel like we're just too, too into it. We're, we're, we're too far to come back. And that may be a little bit worrisome because if you keep just having updates and the new things you welcome in and you, you just, expand exponentially the complexity. So the herd of horses. There you some dog. Barn down. Yeah. Well, well, let me put it to you this way. Did the US government appear to learn anything at all from what Edward Snowden did to the NSA? And the answer is no. They actually <laughs> didn't. They didn't learn a damn thing. In fact, they've been cheerfully going and doing more of the stuff that caused them to have that particular problem which is more and more stuff is getting subcontracted out, less and less stuff is being understood, and there's less and less understanding of where the data is and who has access to it, and that all makes it easier and easier for someone to just walk off with it. So this, obviously, I mean, we can, we can blame the technology, but it all comes back to us as humans uh, making these decisions or uh, the lack of a decision driving this forward. And keeping with the, uh, the, the theme that you have here, what, what do you see for the profession, the professional that's responsible for protecting the systems and the data? Are, are, is the responsibility going to continue to mount? Um, is the complexity and lack of understanding going to continue to, to grow? I think that the responsibility is already about where it needs to be. Most of the security practitioners understand all the stuff that I'm talking about. They, they get it. But corporations really just, they don't care. They just want it to go away. Um, and, you know, they're getting what they want. They're, they're making it go away. Um, we, we, we saw, I guess, a 15, maybe a 20-year effort 
in trying to shame corporations into not leaking data all the time by making it news when somebody leaked a million credit cards or whatever. And that had absolutely no effect on the rate at which personal information continued to leak from large companies. And large companies have now realized that, uh, well, it really actually doesn't matter very much what we do to the point where, you know, companies like Facebook have monetized that and made that their business model is essentially to, to shovel people's data around. I, I don't see any way that the situation is going to get better. Um, there's no desire to make the, to make the situation better. Um, and I think security practitioners, you know, you talk to any security practitioner, they're going to tell you that they're used to getting steamrolled by the IT departments. And I think that's true. Security keeps getting steamrolled by the IT departments, and that's the way it is. And we should get used to that. We are used to that. We should remain used to that. But we also should accept the fact that security is going to continue to suck because yeah, the, the IT departments do steamroller over security and go, well, we, you know, we, how do we put this stuff into the cloud securely? And you go, well, there really isn't any way you can put that stuff into the cloud security. Oh, okay. Well, given that we're putting it into the cloud, how can you put it into the cloud <laughs> security? Is really, and you go, well, there really isn't any way of doing that. And they go, you know what, we're going to find somebody who's going to say, say what we want to hear. Mm. That's how it works. Yeah. So, Marcus, as, as we wrap here, one of the things we we try to talk about um, in another channel called the business of security is looking at security as a business enabler. So, yeah. extracting value, and you're chuckling already. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm asking this question purposely. Do, do you ever see a, a point where security isn't steamrolled, where it actually perhaps has a role in the business to to say, we want you to move to the cloud or we want you to leverage this technology because it is secure and you'll get better results for delivery and costs and whatever it might be that you're trying to achieve as a business. Right. And that's the issue. That's just what I call using IT correctly. I mean, if you work for an organization that, for example, example, publishes maps and you figure out some clever way of putting the maps on someone else's machine so that it's more highly accessible. And then you come up with some clever way of using some encryption so that the maps can be encrypted and decrypted in chunks. And you're not essentially publishing them to the whole world, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, you have to design your systems with an eye towards the, the, the fundamental capabilities that you need. I actually nowadays advise people to leave security off that list because they're going to leave it off that list anyway and just focus on reliability and redundancy, right? Which is, which is completely bizarre. You know, I'll talk to people and they go, well, we really don't have a lot of time to spend doing stuff on security. And I go, well, you had time, you had time to buy two internet connections and to have a high availability firewall pair between the two. And they go, well, that's because uptime's important. So well, what about if you're, you know, what about if your system's image gets wiped out by some hacker? That's uptime, right? So think about this as an uptime problem, as a reliability problem. And then when you think about it as an uptime and reliability problem, you can also talk now about cost of management because of the complexity that you're building in for the necessary reliability to, to get that uptime. So the, the way I see it is it's all part of this, you know, nebulous process that I call good design, which comes from having a competent um, chief technology officer and competent executive IT people. And part of being a competent IT executive is not just buying whatever Gartner tells you to buy this week because it's hot. It's figuring out what do you need? What do you really need? What are you trying to do? And in a lot of cases, the, the only way to really do that is to step away from the habit that we security people have had for a long time where we try to do security for the entire network. And that's, that's not necessary either. Maybe what you need to do is set back and go, well, what parts of the network do we need a certain type of security for? Maybe we need to control who can plug what into what switch in our data center, but maybe we don't have to control that on our guest wireless network you know, or whatever. You, you, you've got different things that you need to do in different, in different zones. And that's where I think that the whole model of kind of firewalls and old school security, it's never going to go away. 
you're going to need something that defines this zone versus that zone. And then the question is, what do you want to do between those zones? If you say, we want to do everything between everything, then you've got you know, no, no security at all. You don't know what you're doing. But how do you um, party between the zones? How do you get between the zones? Well, I said it's a party between the zones. <laughs> no, yeah, it's totally a party. But you know, I, I see that I see that all the time, and it it scares me. I mean, I, I would like I would like to be able to sit down with someone who makes an engineer uh, an aircraft in flight entertainment system, and I'd like to be able to ask them, you know, did you run? did you run two loops of copper or did you just run one and use VPN, uh, you know, VPNs or, or VLANs? You know, I'd like to know. And that comes back to, you know, the old security concept of assurance, which is how sure are you that the mechanisms that you put in place work the way that you think that they do. And on that topic, um, there's a book that I think most security practitioners should read it's a bit of an academic book. It was written by a non-security guy, but it's called the Huawei Snowden Question. And it basically slices security apart into you're going to have systems that you know something about, and you're going to have systems that you know nothing about. And that's the Huawei axis. And then you're going to have systems administrators that you know something about, and you're going to have systems administrators that you don't know anything about. And if you take those factors into account, there's a hard limit on how good your security can possibly be. And that's important to, that's important to understand. And that's where, that's where, that's where I am right now, where I say things are pretty dark. Um, You want me to tell you something really scary? Go for it. Yep. Okay. Here's the theory that I have. When you look at stuff like the Intel management engine that got built into motherboards all around the world, how did that happen? <laughs> That's insane, right? You would think that some security people someplace had some input into that, but instead, no, you have a, a Minix microkernel running with full, full access to the bus um, on a processor that's running on basically every desktop in the world. And that happened and that got deployed without anyone in the security community knowing anything about it. There's all kinds of backdoors that have been built built into all kinds of things by the U.S. National Security Agency, by other intelligence agencies all over the place. And the fact that there are these backdoors that are being built into systems and the capability for building those backdoors exists, I think it sets an upper limit on how good security can be. If anyone wants to break security, all they have to do is try to figure out where those backdoors exist and how to, how to exploit them. So right now, the hackers that we're up against are they're looking for flaws in published software. They're looking, they're, they're looking for the easy stuff. The barrier to entry for hacking systems is so low that you don't really have to do much more complicated things than you know, convince someone to go to the wrong website or mouse over the wrong application. So if we ever get to the point where we start pushing security to where it's very difficult and it's very costly for an attacker to get around our security, they're gonna start reaching for the higher apples up the tree. And the problem is thanks to the subversion that's been built into our systems, there are an infinite number of apples up that tree. So security is going to only be as good as we're willing to make it. And that's not very good because at the top, there's always gonna be a built-in limit that was built into it by the forces who subverted all of our systems. Well, that's not dark at all. No, I think, <laughs> no, I, honestly, it, it, it makes you think, right? I it mean, certainly it, does. it is dark. Well, I, but just said computer, I said computer security is a wasted pursuit. That's what I just said. Yeah. I well, just said it, it really nicely. <laughs> and it also sounds that it, it comes down to good planning and not just being carried away in opening new windows and literally I'm talking about physical windows when you have the metaphor of, you know, you're, you're letting, you're letting stuff in something bad is going to come and uh, maybe simply fine. Uh, maybe the lesson here, like if you have a, a much more simpler environment, you can probably control a little bit better. Well, but that, that's, uh, that's an extreme scenario. So is yeah. there an, and I know we're getting close on time here, but I want to know, is there an extreme solution i mean no. do we have do we have to go 
Do we have an alternative you. ending? That's the question. Yeah. No, there, there, there isn't. See, that's the problem. Hmm. Um, you would need to build your own stuff all over, right? And well, that, that is, that's an extreme solution, though. That, that's you, build not, your own, you build your own stuff? No, but it doesn't work. <laughs> people who are, are going to build that stuff, you're going to have NSA employees in, in the staff on that project because that's what they do. Their job is to, their job is to subvert everything from the get-go. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're developing something like open boot or safe boot technology so that nothing can get between the metal and the bootstrap uh, process, someone is, as you're developing that, someone is trying to develop a, a way of countering that because it's their job to do that as well. Um, and that, you know, that's a big problem. This is, this is where I kind of part part company with most of the security community. There's a lot of people in the computer security that are com computer security world that are living fat, dumb, and happy off of the government government contracts. Um, they're perfectly happy with this, and they've built this environment, which is you know massively subverted and not very reliable. <laughs> uh, Someone's gonna someone's gonna owe someone an apology someday, but it's gonna be a long time from now. Until that day, I suppose uh, we we continue to limp along. <laughs> and, well, that's uh, uh, you know, Nat Nat Howard once said something I think was very important, which is he said security will always be exactly as bad as it can possibly be and no worse. What he was identifying there is the consequences of that pressure that I'm talking about. The fact that there's always going to be apples further up the tree that somebody can reach for if they really need to exploit an attack. It means that there's always going to be a cost that someone's willing to pay to get into your system, which means that you need to just accept the fact that it's, it's okay for me to put my stuff in the cloud if I want to, but that's because it's just my stupid personal website. But would I put my would I put really sensitive information in the cloud? Hell no! Um, you got to be stupid to do that. And and you know usually when you say something like that, oh you know you got to be stupid to put your sensitive information in the cloud. People go, but we're doing it. Yes, you're dumb. We're, dumb. All, stu we're all stupid. <laughs> we're all stupid. It's stupid. Well, listen, Marcus. It, it doesn't appear to be a Hollywood ending. Not in, not in any define your own ending scenario here but um reality is reality we'll, we'll see this play out i suppose <laughs> over the years and um yeah i guess uh i, I guess to wrap i, I think we, we have our current reality and uh sure. we we make we make the most of that hopefully and the big, whatever, the, big whatever picture, that is. the big picture is we're going to be lucky if we have a technological civilization in another hundred years anyway so whether whether we're using Kubernetes or, or well, Office 365, uh, the, the environmental changes that are coming on the planet and the economic effects of those are going to be so profound that it's been, you know, a lot of this stuff is going to go away. Back to Nobel. And with that, this podcast <laughs> is going away and we hope that <laughs> everybody enjoys this conversation. I sure did. I, I, I like to talk about scenarios either they're good or bad they make you think and That's as great. usual sean i hope that everybody listening to this conversation they have a lot more questions in their head right now than what than answers exactly. and that means we it's, did a, it's an interesting redefining security so thank Absolutely. you very much marco marco and marcus sure. <laughs> bye, bye thank you sean <laughs> bye nintex is the global standard for business process management and automation the Nintex platform helps their clients accelerate progress on their digital transformation journeys by quickly and easily managing, automating, and optimizing business processes. Learn more at Nintex.com. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at Imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. 
We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.